have like 10 questions I want to ask. The first, though, is okay. what implications does that have for a second Trump term in that case? Um, you're talking not only about him uh, passing the evaluation, but now there, there, there does seem to be some development. Um, if we're looking to a possible second Trump term, what implications could that potentially have? And um, yeah, I, I also, maybe you can answer at the same time. Uh, we've had other psychologists and psychiatrists on the show over the past few years that I know um, have received pushback and criticism for doing these sorts of evaluations. And they've talked about how it is difficult to do these things in some cases when you can't sit down with a you know a potential patient, but they feel like they have you know as your organization says a duty to inform. So how do you balance the need to make sure that people have the information that they need? Have you received pushback? So what do you think about these two things? Well, well, there is a school of thought. There is definitely pushback under. You probably heard of the Goldwater Rule. Uh, it's an actual ethical principle in both the uh, psychiatric code of ethics and the uh, psychological code of ethics that you shouldn't diagnose from a distance. You shouldn't diagnose someone without their permission. And obviously, that's a very valid ethical principle. In the case of a public figure, figure and specifically Trump, however, there is a competing ethical principle, which is the duty to warn. Mental health professionals, when they um, see that someone might be a danger to other people, have a duty to warn. So after 2016, for many of us that got involved in uh, giving opinions about Trump, uh, we relied on that principle. And even though there's some pushback there, as far as I know, there hasn't been any uh, formal re uh, repercussions. Um, and as I alluded to earlier, it is hard for many diagnoses. The neurocognitive one is an example, but it is hard to uh, complete a full evaluation unless you sit down with the client. But that is not true for some conditions, and it is particularly not true uh, for the diagnosis of clinical psychopathy, which rests on information about their life, not what they might say or do in an interview. Okay. Uh, related to this, you talked earlier about how the the, the term psychopath or psycho, psychopathy is used sort of in common parlance, like non-academic, to mean certain things. People see you know depictions of this in TV and movies, which right. um, I, I've heard is not always accurate, actually. So um, if if you believe that he has passed that bar, what should people know to understand the implications of that for a politician, for a president? Yeah, well, let me just say that when um, when the assessment process for this condition was um, developed in the late 1970s, it became kind of the gold standard uh, for research. And subsequently, there have been over 80,000 studies using this assessment process. So someone that crosses that threshold, like Donald Trump, we now have a great deal of data. There's a lot we can say about him and a lot we can say with authority. And I'm afraid to report the implications are are kind of ominous for someone with that condition. Um, there are many things to say. Probably the the most fundamental finding is that people who have this condition uh, through some data, uh, significant statistical data reduction techniques, we've kind of boiled down the condition. P people that have this condition are ruled by three sets of traits. Um, and those three are um, impulsivity. The psychopath um, is, you should think of impulsivity in a psychopath as like ADD on steroids. Uh, they have basically no capacity to focus on anything beyond their immediate self-interest. They're just tethered to a um, what's in it for me and how can I win the moment? Their ability to handle anything more thorny and complex is just not available to them. Um, you know, the disastrous response uh, to COVID is, you know, probably the most tragic example of that. And we now know from reporting there was never even a, a plan of a plan. It was totally beyond Trump. So impulsivity is a hardwired uh, lifelong characteristic of psychopaths. Uh, which obviously is an extreme vulnerability for someone in the Oval Office. Um, the second trait is probably the one we associate most closely with psychopaths, which is remorselessness. 
Psychopaths are undaunted by punishment. They have no moral fear of any uh, neglectful or deceitful or divisive behavior. And we now know that that's linked to some brain abnormalities that are probably inherited, actually. And the brain abnormalities mean that the clinical psychopath, someone who meets the diagnostic criteria, just doesn't have the capacity, like 99 plus percent of us, to experience the emotions of guilt, shame, and to a large extent, fear. They just don't process those emotions. And so while those emotions can be painful, they're humanizing emotions. They're the emotions that enable us to consider um, what effects our actions might have on others and to balance our more selfish impulses with deeper, deeper aims. The psychopath just doesn't have that emotional infrastructure. And that, of course, is quite dangerous. Um, you mentioned the fictional characters. Um, I, I think there's no question that Hannibal Lecter was uh, meant to portray <laughs> psychopath. He was referred to that. And uh, I think he actually did a good job of portraying that quality, the remorselessness quality. Uh, they referred uh, to I think so. I'm oh, yeah. sorry, continue. Well, no, I just, there, there was one moment in the movie, I, they referred to him when he was, they actually had him hooked up to a monitor uh, when he was... Um, in the process of uh, murdering one of his victims and his, you know, his heart rate just didn't get very high. And that mm -hmm. kind of captures the brain abnormality and the inability to experience uh, guilt, fear, and shame. Uh, a psychopath is not going to be um, impacted by actions that might have a, a negative impact on others, you know, children in cages, overflowing morgues, again, being the the tragic examples from from the uh, you know from his first administration. Yeah, and I'm sure it's no coincidence that you brought up Hannibal Lecter, considering Donald Trump cannot do a public address these days <laughs> without know. talking about Hannibal Lecter for some reason that makes yeah. no sense to me. <laughs> Open <laughs> question as to whether he thinks it's a fictional character or a real person. It mm -hmm. seems to depend on the day. Yeah. Um, but I, I wanted to ask you just, just to finish. I said three, and the third one is this drive to dominate. Uh, the psychopath, again, probably because of brain abnormalities, just doesn't have the um, capacity to empathize or care deeply about another. Uh, but they're not detached. Uh, they're very engaged by life, and the engagement is all in this win at all costs. I must dominate the other person. So that's the third quality. And and what we've learned is the psychopath is really kind of a puppet on the strings of those three hardwired core traits.